So in what field do the solutions of polynomial equations reside? We know at this point that if we can take a polynomial that's irreducible over the rational numbers and extend the rational numbers to get a bigger field, that if that is a normal extension, then that extension will contain all of the roots of that polynomial. In other words, what we'd like to be able to do is to extend the rational numbers in such a way that our previously irreducible polynomial will factor into a product of a couple of factors, but not just factor a little bit. We want it to factor completely. In other words, we need to find a way to split the polynomial. Right? We need to be able to discover all of the factors, all of the linear factors, that make up that irreducible polynomial. And if we do that, we have found exactly a field that's big enough to contain all of that polynomial's roots. In this video, we're going to talk about a way, a canonical way, to do that. In other words, a way that will always work to construct a field which contains all the roots of an irreducible polynomial over the rationals, but which doesn't have any extra fluff. That field is called the splitting field. And we're going to say that the splitting field is every polynomial's BFF. Question is, what is the least that we have to do in order to extend a field to capture all the roots of an irreducible polynomial? If I have something like t cubed minus 2, what's the least that I have to do to build a field in which t cubed minus 2 splits? That field that we get is called the splitting field of that polynomial. And in many ways, the polynomial itself and its splitting field carry the same types of information, which is why they're best friends forever. So recall what we said about normal extensions. When we extend a field to find new roots of a previously irreducible polynomial, we might get some of its roots, or we might get all of its roots. t cubed minus 2, if we extend by the real cubed root of 2, only contains one of the roots of the polynomial t cubed minus 2, because the others are not even real. They're 2 to the 1 third times these cubed roots of unity. And so that extension is not normal over the rationals, because those missing roots prevent us from splitting t cubed minus 2 completely into linear factors in E. On the other hand, this quartic polynomial which has a root of square root of 3 minus square root of 2. If that field contains radical 3 minus radical 2, then it also contains radical 3 plus radical 2, as well as minus radical 3 minus radical 2, and minus radical 3 plus radical 2. In other words, it can't contain one of those roots unless it also contains all of the others. And because it contains all of those other roots, this quartic polynomial completely splits into linear factors over E. And it splits into linear factors over E because exactly all of its roots belong to the field E. We cannot have one of them unless we also have all of the others. And we showed in the last video that that indicates that E is in fact a normal extension of the rationals. But the question is, is this the best way to find a field in which our polynomial splits. Might this polynomial, t to the fourth minus 10t squared plus 1, split over a smaller field? So I think of it like a Goldilocks story. It's Goldilocks in the three fields. What does it take to split a polynomial? Let's think about another one, t to the fourth plus 2, as a polynomial over the rationals. My question is, which of the following irrational numbers do we have to include in order to split this polynomial completely? So the idea here is we've got t to the fourth plus 2 is our Goldilocks. If Goldilocks tries, tries out one of these extension fields, let's say q would join the square root of negative 2. Well, it turns out that over that field, this polynomial splits into quadratic factors, but no further. So this field is evidently too small. It doesn't contain enough irrational numbers to be able to split this polynomial completely. On the other hand, the fundamental theorem of algebra guarantees for us that there's this gigantic bed, namely the field of complex numbers, over which any polynomial, and in particular this one, will split into linear factors. But using the complex numbers for this purpose is way too much. There's way too much in this field. Is there a way to find a field in between that's just right? What field is going to split this polynomial? And is the smallest such field that splits this polynomial? To answer this question, we're going to try factoring t to the fourth plus 2 over a variety of extension fields using Mathematica. Let's see what we discover. 
Let's begin by seeing if p factors over a field that contains i. So I'll just ask Mathematica to factor p of t using the extension i. And we find out that it doesn't. Does that mean that i is not a part of the splitting field? Well, we don't know that for sure yet. Let's try some of these other numbers. What about the square root of 2? Well, square root of 2 by itself doesn't seem to work. But does that mean that square root of 2 doesn't belong to the splitting field? Not necessarily. How about the square root of negative 2? That would just be i times the square root of 2. And now look at this. If we include the square root of negative 2 in our extension, then we actually do get a factorization. It's not a perfect factorization. It's not a splitting, for example. But it shows that t to the fourth plus 2 is, in fact, not irreducible over a field where we extend the rationals by the square root of negative 2. Now let's investigate these last ones, including a fourth root of 2 in it. So if I have 2 to the 1 fourth, 2 to the 1 fourth also gives us a factorization of t to the fourth plus 2 that was different than the one that we just saw. Again, the polynomial doesn't split completely over this field extension, but it at least is not irreducible anymore. So we get some factorization. How about negative 2 to the power 1 fourth? Oh, this is even more interesting. So now we get a factorization that has three factors in it, two of which are linear factors. In other words, our polynomial has two of its roots in this extended field, the simple extension of the rationals by the fourth root of negative 2. But because we still have a quadratic irreducible factor over here at the end, this is not yet the splitting field. So how do we get to the splitting field? Evidently, we need to still be able to factor this polynomial on the end. And what this polynomial on the end is probably missing is the ability to have the number i by itself. So let's try adding i into this mix and see what happens. Now we have a complete factorization of t to the fourth plus 2. Notice this would also have worked if we used the fourth root of positive 2 as well. Mathematica reports a different factorization, but it's still a splitting. So evidently, the splitting field of this polynomial has to contain both the real fourth root of 2 and the complex unit i. So we discover here that i and radical 2 must belong to a field that splits t to the fourth plus 2. And therefore, the square root of negative 2 also must belong to this field that splits t to the fourth plus 2. On the other hand, the fourth root of 2 also must belong. But the fourth root of negative 2 doesn't have to. And it certainly doesn't have to be all of the complex numbers. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a field that's just right. And the definition is that if f is a field, and e is the algebraic closure of that field, in other words, e is where we know we can locate all of the roots of any polynomial over f, then if I have a polynomial p with coefficients in f, we say that its splitting field in e is the smallest subfield of e that completely splits this polynomial. As our example, the splitting field of t to the fourth plus 2 that we discovered in Mathematica contained, at minimum, the numbers i and the real fourth root of 2. That's the smallest field, because if I take either of those two away, my polynomial doesn't split completely anymore. It might factor a little bit, but it doesn't factor completely. And along the way, we also got some of those partial factorizations, partial splits, if you like. So there's a field that just contains the fourth root of 2, but not i. If we extend to that field, then t to the fourth plus 2 ends up factoring a little bit, not splitting. It does split if we go all the way to the field that contains i and the real fourth root of 2. It's an interesting question. Why, when we extend using i first and then using the fourth root of 2, that we don't get any factorization at the first step, and then we do get all the factorization at the last step? So one of the things we'll come to appreciate is that there are multiple different ways to construct a field when we're extending more than once. Here we extend by the real fourth root of 2 first, and then by i to get a splitting field. But we would really get the same thing if we extended first by i, and then by 2 to the 1 fourth. But the factorizations along the way might look different. And of course, there's a this always works theorem associated with splitting fields as well. That for any polynomial, its splitting field in E always exists. And that splitting field is unique up to isomorphism. In other words, the only difference between two splitting fields for a polynomial is just the basis that we take for e over f. So we denote the splitting field with a capital sigma, or if we like being explicit, split e of p. 
In other words, it's split P. Mm -mm, good. So why is the this always works theorem true? Easiest way to think of it is that there's an obvious way to construct a splitting field. Because the splitting field is exactly the field that contains all of the roots of our polynomial and no more. So let's just adjoin exactly the roots of P and nothing else to our base field to make a splitting field. So if I have a polynomial P and its roots are alpha 1 up through alpha n, then just adjoining alpha 1 through alpha n to f will always give us a splitting field, which is unique up to isomorphism for P. So that seems not very interesting, but why it's interesting is that it doesn't really tell us what the structure of that field is. It doesn't tell us what the elements of sigma look like. It just tells us that this field has to contain all of alpha 1 through alpha n. So it's still an interesting question to ask, what does the structure of a splitting field for a given polynomial look like? And it's indeed one of the questions that's going to consume us for the rest of the semester, because there is such a close relationship between polynomials and their splitting fields that learning about the splitting field can tell us what we need to know about the polynomial. More than that, splitting fields also give us one additional benefit. We talked about normal extensions in the last video, but we didn't really come up with a good way of proving that a given extension was normal. And it turns out that not only is every splitting field for a polynomial by construction a normal extension, but every finite normal extension is also a splitting field for some polynomial. So it's a two-way street. Every splitting field is a normal extension, and every finite normal extension is a splitting field. Why? Well, by definition, if E is a splitting field of some polynomial, then it has all of the roots of that polynomial. And because it contains all the roots of that polynomial, as long as P is irreducible, that makes E a normal extension of F. Going the other way, if we have a finite normal extension of F, then we should be able to find a minimal polynomial for some element, which is in E but not in F. And the minimal polynomial there will be exactly the P for which E is the splitting field. So what does the process look like to find a splitting field for a given polynomial? Let's take a look at t to the fourth plus 2 one last time, breaking it into steps. So starting from the rationals, t to the fourth plus 2 is irreducible, so we can't factor it at all. But it shouldn't take too much convincing to first realize that if I want to factor t to the fourth plus 2, I'm going to need a fourth root of 2 in there somewhere. And so my first step might be to extend the rationals to the rationals that join the fourth root of 2. To understand that extension, we'll understand it via the minimal polynomial t to the fourth minus 2. That makes this a degree 4 extension of the rationals. Why is it a degree 4 extension? Because a basis for q adjoined fourth root of 2 over q consists of 1, the fourth root of 2, the square root of 2, which is a fourth root of 2 squared, and the fourth root of 8, which is a fourth root of 2 cubed. So the powers of the fourth root of 2 along with 1 form our basis for this extension field over q. Therefore, it's four-dimensional, and we have a degree four extension. And indeed, over that extended field, we get some factoring of t to the fourth plus two. But it only factors into quadratic factors. That also implies that there are no roots of t to the fourth plus two inside of this extended field. It factors a little bit, but none of those factors are linear. And you'll notice that none of these factors are reducible any further because none of them have real roots. If you look at the discriminant of these quadratics that we factored into, they have the same discriminant as one another. And that discriminant, b squared minus 4ac, is negative 2 radical 2. Because that discriminant is negative, that means that the roots of these quadratics are not real. In order to find those roots, then, we're going to need to include some non-real numbers. Why? Because we need, ultimately, to be able to take the square root of this discriminant, which is now a negative real number. So if we need the square root of this thing, what do we need in our big field, our splitting field? We need the square root of that negative sign, and we also need the square root of 2 radical 2. Well, the square root of 2 radical 2 is just the fourth root of 8. So we're OK on that one, because we already have that inside of our smaller extended field. What we don't have is i. So that's our missing link. To finish our splitting field, then, let's just adjoin i to what we have. q adjoin the fourth root of 2, and then adjoin i. What's the minimal polynomial for this extension over q adjoin the fourth root of 2? It's t squared plus 1. t squared plus 1 is irreducible over the green extended field here, because it's quadratic, and its roots do not belong to that green field. Therefore, this last extension here is a degree 2 extension 
because a basis over q adjoined fourth root of 2 consists of 1 and i. And we can show that over this extended field, our t to the fourth plus 2 now splits completely because all of its roots belong to this extended field. So that must be our splitting field because there's no subfield of it in which this polynomial completely splits. The last question that I want to ask, now that we know what this splitting field is, what is a basis for this splitting field, not over q adjoined the fourth root of 2, but over q itself? In other words, if I want to understand what a generic element of this splitting field looks like over the rationals, what elements do I need in that basis? So our question is, what is a set of rationally independent elements of this splitting field look like? Well, we already have 1 square root of 2, 4 root of 2, 4 root of 8. We knew that those are rationally independent at our first step. So those must definitely belong to a basis. We have to be able to use those in order to express an element to this splitting field. When we went up to the last step, we gained an i. And because i is rationally independent of these others, it must also be an element in this basis. But when we get i, because this big thing is still a field, we also have to get every multiple of what we had before multiplied by i. Therefore, we're going to get i times the fourth root of 2, i times the square root of 2, i times the fourth root of 8. And because those real versions were rationally independent to begin with, their complexified, yes, that's a word, versions are also rationally independent. Therefore, our complete set of rationally independent elements, which is a basis for my splitting field over q, consists of 1, which came from our base base field, the fourth root of 2 and its powers that came from our intermediate field, and then i times each of those things, which is going to reside only in our largest field that we have here, our splitting field. So a basis for our splitting field over q has eight elements in it. Therefore, the degree of our splitting field over the rational numbers is 8. Is there a way that we could have known that without explicitly writing out the basis? Of course. It's 4 times 2, and 4 and 2 were the degrees of each step of our extensions in what we call a tower. When I say a tower, I mean an extension of an extension. And because we extended first by something of degree 4 and then by something of degree 2, we're going to be guaranteed to get an extension that in total has degree 8. That's an instance of what we call the tower law that says that degrees of finite extensions are multiplicative in a tower. If I finitely extend a finite extension, then the degree of the total extension is the product of the degrees of each one. So there's the process of computing a splitting field for this, for this particular polynomial. Where we want to go with this next is to begin to understand more about the structure of that splitting field. And that's where we get into a discussion of automorphisms of fields that's going to take us to our finish line in this course.